if you can hear me. Yeah, you can you hear me? Okay. All right. So today we are going to do a review of uh, all the exploration schemes that have been tried. Or well, not all, but some of the exploration schemes that have been tried in the literature for multi-arm bandit problem. So before I begin, um, we have done quite a bit of uh, reinforcement learning, particularly in the context of multi-arm bandit. I have a philosophical question to ask. When you don't know something about the system, about a dynamic system, and you take an action, what exactly are the two criteria that you are trying to optimize? Okay, so the question, let me, re let me repeat the question. You have an unknown system, unknown dynamic system. Uh, you are taking actions and you are receiving information about what the state of the system is or what the reward you are getting from the system. Um, what are, how, what's your action trying to do? What's your action trying to attempt um, in that particular situation? Yeah. So uh, we have two goals. We yeah. are attempting to, uh, based off the information we have at the time, achieve the highest reward we can. Right. And we're also trying to explore in a way that gives us information about the rest of the system but minimizes the penalty we pay right. for exploring. Perfect. So there are two goals. One is look at the current information and take an action which gives me good rewards immediately at this point of time. Um, and the second one is exploration, which is excite the system in a way that you can get more information about the system and that will improve your future reward, future prospects, okay? So those are the two specific uh, goals that you are trying to optimize when you are taking an action for a system which is sort of unknown to you. This idea is not something new and in 1960, a Russian mathematician, Feldbaum, uh, wrote a paper and he called it caution and probing. These are the two, uh, these are the two goals of a control action. So caution means you want to be cautious uh, and not pay too much penalty in terms of cost or uh, not have too little reward based on the information you have received so far. And probing is trying to attempt to understand the system. Um, try to understand the unknown parameters and perhaps get better rewards in the future once you have a better understanding of the system. There is a third aspect that was discovered perhaps in 70s, which is, also, which is known as signaling. And signaling is, uh, is a beautiful concept. So it's, uh, it's discovered in game theory, it's discovered in controls literature. Uh, so these are the role of actions in unknown system. Role of action in stochastic slash unknown systems. So signaling is a way to reveal your information through your action, okay? So let me give you an example. Okay, some people are still writing. So let me try to uh, give an example of signaling. Suppose I, I'm standing in front of you and I do something like this. What do you make out of it? I, I didn't say anything. I just took an action, which is something like this. Okay. So what do you what do you make out of this action? You fed up of us. Sorry. You fed up of us. You. You fed up of us. No ants. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, anything else? I would have gone with annoyance. Annoying, right? So it could be either annoying or it could be I have a headache or it could be that I'm very disturbed or something like that, right? So, sorry? 
fed up of his students. <laughs> okay, maybe I shouldn't say that because most of my PhD students are taking this class. Uh, so anyway, so that what what happens is you look at an action of an agent, and based on that action, you try to understand what's the information that the agent has. Okay, so the agent, which is in this case myself, I have the information about whether I'm annoyed, disturbed, or uh, fed up of my students. Okay, and based on my action, you have developed a belief on what sort of information I have. So I don't. So you, you definitely know that I'm not happy. Okay, nobody does this while I'm happy, right? So so you know. So you you have an updated belief on based on the action. You have an updated belief on what I know, right? And that is known as signaling. It's very useful in. I mean, it's been studied in game theory as well as controls literature. And uh, uh, I guess some folks have received Nobel, Nobel Prize in uh, economics for, uh, oh yeah, actually, Akerlof has got Nobel Prize in economics for um, writing some of the first papers on signaling. Uh, I think the Nobel Prize was given in 93. But anyway, signaling is something that we won't really talk about uh, uh, in this class until we reach the multi-agent reinforcement learning later on. But Doesn't the concept of signaling imply that we expect there to be a separate agency in the problem? Yes. So there has to be multiple agents in the problem. Or if you have a single agent, then the agent should have limited memory. Because that's when your action would start revealing information that you have had in the past. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so signaling is something that we wouldn't worry about right now. but we are worried about caution and probing, and most of the reinforcement learning literature, particularly with respect to exploration versus exploitation trade-off, is essentially the same as caution versus probing trade-off that people in a control theory community have studied since 1960s. All right, so caution versus Exploitation. This is improves current reward. And then probing versus exploration improves future rewards. And there is a tension between these two. Uh, ideas, uh, these two goals, and the agent has to carefully uh, understand the trade-off and take it, decides his action based on this trade-off. So the two goals are um, should I say contradictory? The two goals are not contradictory. They are not con mutually exclusive. Sorry? Mutually exclusive. Not mutually exclusive. Conflicting. Conflicting. Okay, good. The two goals are conflicting. Okay, and you need to, of course, when you have multiple agents, then signaling becomes a third problem, and then the three goals are conflicting. So that's why multi agent reinforcement learning is that, is very difficult and um, very few results have been provided in the literature so far. Uh, it's a very hot topic right now, by the way, multi-agent reinforcement learning. So there, the three goals, which is caution, probing, and signaling, these three goals are conflicting. OK. So how, so so far, we have looked at several algorithms. And what they have said is, well, we can do a careful we can come up with careful algorithms that looks at all the information or uh, compresses the information and look at that information to somehow manage the two conflicting goals, which is exploration and exploitation. Okay? Uh, now, of course, we have studied like maybe two or three different algorithms, but, uh, but what exactly are the two broad approaches one is the frequentist approach, 
and the other one is Bayesian approach. And we haven't talked about the Bayesian approach so far. We have mostly talked about frequentist approach for uh, managing the two conflicting goals. For this discussion, are we limiting ourselves to minimizing regret, or is it more general than that? This is more general than that, yeah. OK, so in frequentist approach, you make little assumption, uh, less assumption on reward distribution. So the distribution has bounded support, okay, which is not very, uh, not a strong assumption on the reward distribution. On the other hand, if I say that the distribution is Gaussian with mean between 0 and 1, then that's a very strong assumption. So less assumption on reward distribution uses only moment type information. So this will be clear in a few minutes. So some of the algorithms depend on knowing what the second moment, third moment, or fourth moment of the reward distribution looks like, but nothing beyond that. It doesn't exploit the information structure. And what I mean by this is you take the mean slash median of the data you have received and plus some terms of some function of P and T i T. That's all you exploit. Okay, so let's uh, think about UCB algorithm. Reward is between 0 and 1. No assumption on the distribution except for the fact that it has bounded support. Uh, moment type information, well, in the case of reward being distributed between 0 and 1, you know, all moments are bounded by 1, so uh, nothing much to discuss there. And it doesn't exploit the information structure because it compresses all the information you have received so far into the empirical mean or median. And then you pick some function of t and tit, and then add it to the mean and median. That gives you an index policy. And you um, use that index policy to determine what you should do at a specific point of time. And we have seen that under those situations, uh, even though you have conflicting goals, you are able to achieve a near optimal behavior, which is you are able to get log t regret, order of log t regret. Now the Bayesian approach is slightly more, it, it basically says that look, frequentists use very little information about the actual system, but sometimes or many times we have a lot of information about the system. And somehow this approach doesn't necessarily exploit the extra information we may have about the system. Okay, so people have developed Bayesian approaches for that. So let's see what Bayesian approaches involve. We'll talk about Bayesian approaches in the, in the next class, which is on Thursday. So in this approach, there is a lot of information, a lot of assumption on distribution of rewards. Uh, so particularly distribution is parameterized by theta. Parameterized by theta. Uh, we have a prior distribution on theta. on theta n. So theta n is the distribution of n arms. So you have some prior on the 
distribution of different distribution of rewards of different arms exploits Bayes theorem and information received receive to carefully explore so we explore uh, explore and based on information gain This is capital theta. Uh, so this is small theta. This is capital theta. So if you use LaTeX, okay, that looks like this. Okay. So. So the parameters, for instance, so you have a lot of assumption on the distribution. So the distribution is Gaussian. So Gaussian is parameterized by mean and variance. So the theta contains all possible means and variances of the Gaussian distribution that is producing the reward. OK, and this theta n is uh, for each arm, you have a specific theta, so theta 1 all the way to theta n. And you have some prior distribution on theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, all the way up to theta n. prior distribution on theta 1 to theta n which lies in theta n okay so what happens in bayesian uh, approach is you make a lot of assumption on the distribution of the rewards so the rewards are bernoulli um, with uh, parameter p so p is the parameter the, there is a prior distribution on the parameters for n arms. So you have p1 all the way up to pn in the case of Bernoulli distribution. And let's say p1 all the way up to pn are, I don't want to say uniformly distributed. Well, it could be uniformly distributed, but it could also have some other form of distribution uh, supported between 0 and 1. Okay, so you, ha you assume some prior distribution, you assume some structure on theta that you are going to see for all the arms. And then once you have a prior distribution, you can look at all the information you are receiving. You can use Bayes theorem to update your belief on the parameters. Uh, and we are going to see it in the next class. And you carefully explore based on the amount of information you are going to gain by exploiting or by picking, pulling certain arm. Okay, so you, there is a notion of a metric so as to capture how much information you are gaining about the system by picking a certain arm. So uh, the two algorithms, or there are a few algorithms that we will talk about, uh, Thomson sampling, uh, knowledge gradient, information directed sampling, and so on, all of which has a metric for information gain. And based on that metric, it picks an arm carefully and then updates its belief on thetas using Bayes' theorem. So, uh, so the next class is going to be very probability oriented because we are going to apply Bayes' theorem again and again. So the examples of frequentist approach are UCB, KL, UCB, and we are going to study all these algorithms today. Boltzmann, exploration scheme, Gum Boltzmann Gumbel exploration is scheme, uh, MOSS, and epsilon greedy. So these are frequentist approaches, uh, exploration schemes using frequentist approaches. And then for the Bayesian approaches, the examples are 
Thomson sampling, Bayes UCB, knowledge gradient, information directed sampling, biased MLE, maximum likelihood estimator and and maybe some variants of IDS. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. Uh, using the extra information we have uh, from the Bayesian approach, is it possible to get sub-logarithmic regret or does that? Yeah, okay. you improve on the algorithmic regret. In fact, what happens is in, in, in reality, if you do the experiments, uh, for instance, Thomson sampling for Bernoulli distributed arms, like the rewards have Bernoulli distribution, it's, it outperforms any other exploration scheme. Okay, so. Um, so even though you may or may not get the, the regret, all of them would be order of log t, but uh, if you look at the actual reward accrued over long periods of time, you will see that Thomson sampling, for instance, is much lower than, than uh, the UCB algorithm, the regret of achieved through UCB algorithm. So, okay, any other question? All right, so the, the roadmap for this particular week is, uh, in today's class, I'm going to go over all these different algorithms, exploration schemes for multi-arm bandit. And then in the next class, we are going to talk about all of these exploration schemes in the context of multi-arm bandit. Uh, in order to uh, introduce all these algorithms, I first have to talk about maximum likelihood estimation and then uh, maximum a priori, a posterior, posteriori estimation, so MAP. So I'm going to talk about MLE, MAP, and then we'll talk about all these algorithms for exploration, okay? I'm going to set the uh, notation, or rather I'm going to recall the notation for this class. So regret mu t is equal to summation of delta i expected value of t i t i equals 1 to n, so you have n arms, okay? Delta I is the difference of the means. M hat I T is empirical mean of reward obtained from arm I. Until time T. Anything else? No, I guess that's it. These are the two notations we'll use today. Okay, so let's talk about UCB algorithm. No, maybe I should talk about epsilon greedy. In epsilon greedy, you pick, uh, so mu t i t is to pick arg max m hat i t i equals 1 to n, 
with probability 1 minus n epsilon or n minus 1 epsilon and then some other i with probability epsilon. So you pick the best possible arm with probability uh, 1 minus n minus 1 epsilon and you pick any other arm, the non-optimal other, I should say non-optimal arm You can pick one of the n minus one non-optimal arms with probability epsilon. Okay, it's the simplest exploration scheme which only uses the mean reward that you have observed so far, nothing else. And it doesn't lead to good performance, okay? So that's why people don't use it. But it's still a valid exploration scheme. The next one is UCB. Uh, so now I'm going to use, oh, I'm going to use the index notation. So let me add the index notation, new IT index of arm I at time T. Anyone remembers what was the UCB? The index was m hat it plus square root 2 log t over t i t. This is for rewards in 0, 1. Sorry? No, this is the index. So the mu t will be at maximum arg max of the index. Yeah, so when I talk about index policy, of course, your mu t i t is arg max of nu i t i equals 1 to n. This is the index policy. Uh, we have shown that the regret here is uh, some capital O of log T. This is something that we have shown in one of the previous classes. Okay. So let's look at the approaches. So we have made very little assumption on the reward distribution. Um, this thing doesn't apply because the rewards are all bounded. It doesn't exploit the information structure, right? So all we are using is we compress all the information we have received into just two random variables. One is the mean, empirical mean, and one is the number of times I have played a specific arm until time t. So that's, that's the only information that I'm using. I'm not necessarily using every um, realization in a very meaningful fashion. Okay, so those are the frequentist approaches. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about KLUCB. So let me erase this side. Okay, so for KLUCB, let me use, define a so I'm going to define this DB of PQ, P and Q are numbers between 0 and 1. 
And this is the kullback leibler divergence of Bernoulli P and Bernoulli Q uh, distribution. And this is given by P log P over Q plus 1 minus P log 1 minus P over 1 minus Q. Okay, so what's the index here? Max Q in zero one such that DB M hat IT Q is less than equal to log t plus c log log t over t i t. Well, I'm defining care divergence. Oh, there is a comma. Okay, right. Comma. That's right. Again, here rewards are between zero and one. So that's why this uh, mean, empirical mean, will always be between zero and one. And for this case, uh, the theorem is pick epsilon greater than zero, pick C equals to three, then an I, which is non-optimal arm, then this implies that expected value of T I capital T is less than equal to 1 plus epsilon log T over db m i m star plus c1 log log T plus c C2, which depends on epsilon over T raised to beta epsilon. Okay, so in the case of Bernoulli arm, this is order optimal. Uh, yes. Uh, so at, when Q is equal to M hat I of T, so this is always positive. This number is always positive. So when Q is equal to M hat I T, of course, it's equal to zero. And then as you start increasing the value of Q, remember this is the max between Q and zero and one. As you increase the value of Q, uh, this whole thing is going to start increasing. And then you have to hit this number or, I mean, you could hit 
at q equals to 1, or you could hit it perhaps before q gets to 1, and that's the q star that you will store as an index for that particular arm. Uh, it, it's worth noting that this objective function, so we are maximizing uh, something. So it's actually a convex function of q. So you can do some sort of bisection method or something to identify what the maximum value of q is so that this inequality is satisfied. Uh, that I, okay, so you realize that in this particular example, they bumped up the mean by a certain factor which gave them order of log t regret. Now, you just want a way to, so you just want to construct an index that somehow overestimates the mean reward from that particular arm. So that's one algorithm to overestimate the mean. This is another algorithm to overestimate the mean. Okay, and it just happens to give you very good rewards. Like in the case, I mean in this situation you have log t plus log log t term. So if I divide it by log t, this term goes to zero and this term goes to zero as t goes to infinity. So only this term, oh yeah, only this term will be non-zero if you divide it by log t. So uh, so it gives you an order optimal um, regret. Uh, so regret will be capital O of log t. In this case also. Now, the reason why I'm uh, so so one one important thing is that KL divergence is just one divergence uh, metric between two probability distributions. Uh, there is something known as F divergence and Bregman divergence. Those are the two different, actually I should, I should have distributed it before. But I've, I've downloaded the Wikipedia article on F divergence and Bregman divergence. Those are other notions of divergences between probability distributions. Yes, some more. I'll get it. Jantis. Yeah. Oh. Oh, you got it. Okay. Okay. So. So these authors came up with this scale divergence term and then said that, okay, if scale divergence, if you pick your index in this particular fashion, then, and you pull the arms according to the maximum index, then you get a order log t regret or, uh, yeah, order log t regret. Now, now that's not the only notion of divergence between probability distribution. There is F divergence and then there is uh, Bregman divergence. These are the two other divergences. Now KL divergence is both an F divergence as well as, it's the only divergence, which is both a F divergence as well as Bregman divergence between two distributions. So it perhaps satisfies some special property because of which you get a nice regret bound here. Uh, however, in your simulation or in your research, you can try some of the other divergences. Just replace this DB with any other divergence. Um, and perhaps you will find a different algorithm with a better regret guarantee or a worse regret guarantee. We don't know. So that's something you can do in your research if you're ever interested in exploring this space. Uh, in this particular, so this is a 2011 paper. I forgot the name of the authors. But they have given for exponential, so this is for distributions between 0 and 1. For exponential distribution, they gave some other uh, function here. It's not the dB, but it's some other function. 
and I don't recall what those functions are. It has a somewhat complicated expression, but I encourage you to look at this paper if you want to know uh, how to construct these indices for different distributions, different reward distribution. Um, I'm going to upload these papers on, on uh, Carmen, so that way you will have access to these papers later on after this lecture. Okay, so we have seen two ways to overestimate the reward, uh, overestimate the empirical reward. So one is to add this particular term to the empirical mean. The other is to do some sort of optimization uh, on KL divergence and then figure out what the, uh, what the index should be, okay? And that's, one, uh, that's another way to overestimate the reward. Now, of course, we are using a Bernoulli distribution here. So this is a KL divergence for the Bernoulli distribution. But actually, the rewards could be any distribution, can have any distribution as long as it's supported between 0 and 1. So uh, that's a feature for this particular algorithm. Then the third algorithm I'm going to talk about is Boltzmann and boltzmann gumbel Any question on this? No? So this is this has other names. So it is Gibbs exploration scheme, softmax, exponential weighting, so these are all uh, the same, th the names for the same exploration scheme where mu t i t is a p t, which is a probability distribution over arms, and p t i is directly proportional to exponential of eta t multiplied by m hat i t. Uh, in this case, the rewards are sigma sub Gaussian have sigma sub Gaussian distribution which is defined as Okay, so, so a sigma sub Gaussian distribution satisfies this. So x is distributed according to x is distributed according to distribution uh, what should I name? Let's say pi. Then pi is sigma sub Gaussian if expected value of e raised to y x minus m is less than or equal to x exponential of sigma square y square over 2. Okay, so this is the definition of sub Gaussian distribution. So for any sub sigma sub Gaussian distributed uh, rewards, uh, the Boltzmann exploration is given by uh, this expression. So PTI is directly proportional to exponential of eta t m hat i t. Have we seen this exponential, this kind of uh, exploration scheme so far? Right, so we saw it in the context of uh, contextual bandit exponential weighting scheme. It, it was EXP3 and EXP4, those are the two algorithms which uses schemes of this type. So, P 
pti is equal to exponential m hat i t over summation exponential eta t m hat j t j equals 1 to n. Okay, so this was the exploration scheme in contextual bandit. EXP3 algorithm, it was also the exploration scheme in EXP4 algorithm, and it was also the exploration scheme in SARSA. Okay, remember SARSA algorithm? This was the exploration scheme in SARSA as well. Okay? Yeah. Yes, uh, this is exponential and this is also exponential. So, sorry? So you have to put a log in front then. Uh, so this is this is what I have picked from a paper which was talking about Boltzmann distribution. So I don't know if in the context of some other class you might have been given a different distribution. Uh, I'm, I think it's pretty standard. Uh, is this is this sigma sub Gaussian, Johnny? Oh, I see. There are several equivalent definitions. Okay. <laughs> So x is the random variable, y is just some parameter. So y appears here, y is just a parameter, yeah. Of course, this should hold true for all y. y in r, perhaps y in r. Yeah. It is the learning rate their eta t the same as when we were talking about contextual banded or is it different? Uh, we will pick a learning rate. Uh, eta t has to be picked in a specific fashion. Yeah. What's m there? m. This, this m, this is the mean. So we are using m for mean and x for a random variable. Okay. m is the mean. m is expected value of x. Okay, so, so this is uh, two arms. Let's look at the regret. So two arms, delta equals to m, m1 minus m2. So m1 is, m1 is optimal, so arm one is optimal. Delta is m1 minus m2 and I pick a parameter tau which is 16 E log T over delta square, maybe I'll make it 32. Eta T is equal to one T less than, strictly less than tau and log T delta square over delta this is for t greater than or equal to tau. Then you regret is less than or equal to 16, sorry, 32e log t over delta square plus 9. n over delta square. Okay, so some very complicated uh, way of picking your learning rate eta t will lead you to logarithmic regret. This is not an index policy by the way.
Sorry? Multiple arms. Yeah, they have some results for multiple arms also, which are pretty similar. Yes? Does this have any beneficial properties that the other algorithms do not have? Or is it just something of historical interest that... Something of historical interest. Okay, so Boltzmann exploration scheme has been uh, used in the context of reinforcement learning for a very, very long time. Uh, but the actual analysis was actually done in 2016, maybe 17, uh, by the authors. So, uh, which, is, which is quite surprising that a scheme that has been used for so long has never been actually studied in depth. Uh, for the regret scheme. However, this leads to a different exploration algorithm which is slightly more complicated than Boltzmann scheme. And that is known as Boltzmann Gumbel. Exploration scheme. This exploration scheme was also given in the same paper. Yeah. No, this is M1 minus M2, the true delta. So if you're doing it in practice, you don't know, oh, yeah. So this one requires you to knowledge of both the end of the horizon as well as true delta, yeah. That's a drawback of this algorithm. Uh, not, not the algorithm. Of course, the algorithm has been used for quite a long time. But if you want to get log t regret, then you need to have information both about delta as well as log t or some upper bound or some bound on delta, okay? So it's, it's really not a, not a strong result, not a good result, because it's giving you an, uh, an absurd uh, learning rate schedule, which based on information that you perhaps don't have when you start exploring the system. So this knowledge only needed for the analysis, not for the algorithm to run, right? Sorry? The knowledge of the real means yes. are only needed for, for this analysis, Correct. not for the... Not for the running the algorithm. For running the algorithm, you don't need this information. Okay, um, so what is Boltzmann-Gumbel exploration scheme? So we need to go a little bit into history. Uh, so when do you have... So let's, let's consider, so how many of you know about Gumbel distribution? One, a few people, okay. So what's Gumbel distribution? So I will perhaps take a few minutes for this. So Gumbel distribution has, it's supported on zero to infinity. Uh, the PDF is, e raised to minus x, e raised to minus, e raised to minus x. Okay. Should I use z or should I use x? Uh, let's, let's use x for now. But it's, it's re not related to the reward. And the PDF, e raised to minus, e raised to minus x. This is the standard Gumbel distribution. Okay, so it has a following property, Gumbel, uh, random variable that is distributed according to Gumbel. So let's say A comma B, uh, Let's make it a real number. I don't know whether they need to be positive or not, but they definitely need to be real number. Uh, Z1, Z2, standard Gumbel. Then probability of Z1, plus A less than equal to Z2 plus B is equal to E raised to B over E raised to A plus E raised to B.
It's true even for like uh, if you have n different random variables too. Okay. So this is a property of uh, uh, a Gumbel distributed random variable. In fact, it is used for um, used in economics, discrete choice theory, transportation um, for a very long time, since uh, 1960s and 70s. Uh, but its proliferation in computer science has happened rather recently. Like there were occasional papers once in a while. But uh, this particular paper has brought back this expression in, in limelight again, OK? So if once you know this, what can you say about this exploration scheme? What can you say about this exploration scheme? What is it trying to do? Just consider the simple case of two arms, OK? Can you write an index policy that yields the same exploration scheme? Let's define the index the following way. Nu i t is eta t m hat i t plus z i t. Now z i t is standard gumbel standard gumbel distributed random variable. Okay, and independent of everything that you have seen in the past, independent of everything that uh, you would get for other arms. So this index induces this probability distribution. Okay, it's the same policy. Okay, any question so far? So this is a probabilistic policy, right? That's a probabilistic policy. So they are not the same. This indexing, like I choose one R with a certain. But yeah, but this is something that you. Oh, I see. This is something that you withdraw from a random number generator, okay, okay. right? So, any other question? Okay, so now that I've made this connection that this exploration scheme, Boltzmann Gumbel exploration scheme, sorry, Boltzmann exploration scheme is equivalent to an index policy in which you look at the empirical mean multiplied by eta t and then add a uh, add a gumbel distributed random variable to that particular mean now if i have to if you have to come up with a new exploration scheme what will you do come on guys sorry well no that's that's not the point. <laughs> okay, so you can perhaps pick some other distributed, some other uh, distribution for ZIT. Of course, that's uh, one possible idea. But what else can you do, just with Gumbel distribution and M hat IT? How about? Yeah. Should we be able to clean up what we're saying about that probability bound for the expectation of the regret? In the two-arm case? Uh, no, it has nothing to do with sharpening that regret bound. But instead of multiplying m hat, m hat t with eta t, let's multiply z i t with some appropriately picked term. Okay, and that leads to Boltzmann Gumbel exploration scheme. Okay, now the so in this case, eta t is the same across all arms. Okay, so you don't change it. However, when you move this eta t to this side you have an option of uh, 
of changing it according to how many times you have pulled that particular arm. Okay? So here is the Boltzmann Gumbel scheme. My index is m hat i t plus square root of sigma square over t i t z i t. This is standard gumbel. This is the multiplicative term. This is the empirical mean that I've observed so far. Sorry? Sigma square is the rewards have sigma sub Gaussian distribution. So that's what you're assuming. So all distributions with bounded support are sub, sub Gaussian distribution, and therefore you can find their sigma parameter pretty easily. Okay, so what's the regret that you get from this particular policy? This is order of log t uh, delta i over sigma square square. There is summation of i equals 1 to n. Or maybe I should write delta i strictly positive. So it's log square t, not log t. Okay? That's the regret bound they have this dot cotton. Yeah. Big O is a function class. Shouldn't the sum be inside the operation? Well, there are some. There are some multiplicative factors here. Okay, let me. There are some multiplicative factors here with log square term, and then you sum it over all delta i greater than zero. So, I don't want to. Well, let me just write it as constant. Well, not constant, but constant that depends on i. C i log square t delta i plus sigma square plus some other constant terms. Okay, that makes it easier to read. Okay. Okay, so what have we seen so far in terms of index policies? So one index policy in which you bump up the mean by a deterministic function of t and capital T and uh, sorry, small t and ti t. The second exploration scheme was using KL divergence of Bernoulli distributions to come up with an index. The third exploration scheme was adding a Gumbel distributed random variable, standard Gumbel random variable with a multiplier term eta t to the empirical mean. The fourth um, exploration scheme takes the empirical mean, adds the Gumbel distributed random variable with some uh, multiplicative term that depends on how many times you have pulled the arm. And that gives you a log square t regret. So it's not log t regret, but it's log square t, so it's still uh, good enough. Now the fifth uh, algorithm exploration scheme is MOSS, this is known as minimax optimal strategy in stochastic case. So this is a, a 
algorithm designed for adversarial bandit, but I'm going to talk about its application to stochastic bandit case. So we have rewards in 0, 1. New IT is m hat IT plus square root of max 0 log t over n t i t over t i t. So in this case, you need to know when are you going to stop, okay? Okay, so this is again looking at the mean, empirical mean, bumping it up based on the number of times you have picked some arm and the number of optimal arms, and then it gives you order log t regret, okay? Now, of course, the constants, whenever I write order of log t, the constants are all different across different algorithms. And then you can find a lot of papers comparing these algorithms, uh, the regret achieved through these algorithms and saying one is better than the other for certain situations. Yeah. So explaining the MOS strategy for when, and we're increasing the uh, index x reward we have, Right. It's only when we're considering an arm that has been pulled less than effectively one over n times throughout the process. Right. Okay. Right. That's true. Um, okay. So, any question on different index policies for for multi-arm bandit? So, these are all frequentist approaches. What is it, why it is called like minimax? Oh, because uh, this the same exploration scheme can also be used in adversarial bandit uh, with a good regret uh, bound. Okay, so that's why it has a name of minimax because it's used in uh, some adversarial bandit context also. The same same policy, same index policy, and it has good performance both on stochastic case and adversarial case. So if you are trying to run a uh, an algorithm, a bandit algorithm on a situation where you don't know whether the rewards are coming from a stochastic distribution or whether the rewards are being picked by an adversary, you can use this algorithm and you will know that you will get order optimal regret in both situations. Okay? So that's the beauty of this algorithm, MOSS. I think for the case of adversarial bandit, it's order of square root of t log t, okay? And square root of t is the order optimal in the context of adversarial bandits. So this does well in both situations. Okay, yeah. I have a question. Is there any good, is there any good metric to compare this like, as exploring schemes because they are all like order of log t? So, uh, yeah, so some papers have, for instance, look at a paper that, this, this, uh, that comes up with a new algorithm in 2019. So they will draw the regret for all these algorithms for their simulation. Okay, so you can just look at their simulations and figure out which one works well under what circumstances. 
Okay, but you cannot do a comparative study because as I mentioned, the regret bounds are almost always very loose because you're making a lot of assumptions in the proof in order to get the inequality in the right fashion. And that's why these, these, all these bounds are very loose. So they mean nothing for, well, they, they are good because you always get a log t term somewhere. But uh, if you want to look at an empirical performance on a specific situation, then you have to actually run these algorithms and figure out what they are doing. Yeah. Can we say anything structurally about the different algorithms where they tend to leverage certain problem characteristics so that if we recognize those problem characteristics, we can pick between the algorithms? Or is it that? Uh, I, think, I think there is no good study done to, to give you answer to that question, OK? Uh, as I said, some of these algorithms have been designed in 2016, 2017, 2018. So it's like very recent work. Um, so to give you an example, try this exploration scheme in your Q-learning algorithm or in your some other reinforcement learning algorithm. That algorithm has not been studied. Okay, but if you study it, you can come up with the regret bound for so this is, of course, the bandit case. But if you do it for a regular MDP, you might have to modify this algorithm a little bit and come up with a regret bound. That's a new algorithm and a new study, right? So any other question? OK, so these are, uh, we have talked about five or six different exploration schemes. Let's talk about the Bayesian problem, I'll at least introduce the maximum likelihood estimation today. Okay. How many of you are familiar with maximum likelihood estimation? Oh, do I even need to teach it? <laughs> okay, maybe I should teach because there are still a couple of people who didn't raise their hand. So let's say you have a random variable x, a distribution PDF is fx theta. Theta is the parameter that defines the distribution. Okay, so if you see, if you see observation x1 to xt, then the joint probability, and these are all IID, IID, then the joint probability density function f x1 theta multiplied by f x t theta. Okay, and this is known as likelihood function. likelihood function. Oh, uh, again, theta is the parameter set. So this is the joint PDF. So if you have seen this data set coming out of a uh, IID data set that is coming out of a, uh, of a PDF, uh, of a distribution with PDF fx theta, uh, how would you estimate the value of theta? Well, the idea is you want to maximize this likelihood. So you want to maximize. So compute theta hat t, which maximizes the likelihood function. over all theta in the parameter set, capital theta. And it turns out that this theta hat t converges to true theta in probability under some assumptions on f, very reasonable assumptions on f. Oh, this is as t goes to infinity.
Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, argmax. Okay, so the idea in log in in uh, maximum likelihood estimator is, if you see a set of data points coming out of this PDF, uh, this is the joint distribution. The theta, the true theta, is going to be likely the one that maximizes the total joint distribution of x1 to xt, and so that's what defines this likelihood function. Okay, so that's how you define this likelihood function. And then you estimate theta from the likelihood function through some gradient descent algorithm. So you can use gradient descent, you can use BFGS method, uh, or any other method of your choice in order to compute theta hat t. And it turns out that theta hat t is a consistent estimate of true theta. True theta. So as your data set becomes large, you approach to true theta in probability. OK, so that's a. That's a good thing of for maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, do I have time for MAP? So in this case, we don't have any distribution over the set capital theta. Okay, so where am I going with this? So these are the rewards that you have observed from an arm. Theta would be the mean for the distribution of that arm. And we would like to estimate the mean reward based on the data that we have seen. So we have to make some assumption about the distribution function of the reward uh, from specific arms. Okay, so that's how it connects to the Bayesian approach, where we have to put a lot of structure on the distribution of the, um, of the rewards that you're getting from an arm. There is a corresponding estimator called MAP where you have a prior distribution on theta, okay? So you kind of know that the parameters are distributed according to some fashion within theta, and then based on the data that you are receiving, you want to get a better and better estimate of the parameter based on the prior distribution, okay? So we'll talk about it in the next class, and that is uh, that would be MAP estimator, and then we'll talk about it in the context of banded algorithms. Thank you.